stuff will be uh, included. But as it is of now, you're, you're going to say uh, there's no woman. You know, where are the women? Because they constitute the largest uh, part of, the, of this nation. Thank you all for the question. I will take one more question before the doctor responds. Yes, Madam Bay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Uh, reading, uh, somebody from, I think, around here asked a question to you. You know, uh, I often say to people, especially on the African continent, that we Africans, I think, have not yet understood just how competitive the world is. The reality is that when you look at the um, way the world works, the, the issue, the concept of justice, in my humble opinion, does not exist. Let me just illustrate. So if the Americans have got a view of how life ought to be, anywhere in the world, they use their power. They don't use the concept of justice to go get it done. Life is purely competitive. And to get what the semblance of what is stability maybe when there is a power balance? Life is based on power relationships. And I think that, and I'm not condoning the issue of the issue of uh, rigging elections. I'm not condoning it at all. But when you realistically expect somebody who is in power to do something that is going to make them lose power, I think you dream it because it's never going to happen. So my view is we shouldn't try to promise our people something that's not going to happen. But I also want to remind you that Ian Smith ran this country with a lot of power. And Ian Smith, remember, said nothing will change, not in a thousand years. But it changed. And the reason it changed is because Zimbabweans understood the power that they had as people. And at the moment, we're getting caught up because we are not recognizing the power that we, the Zimbabwean people, have. That's what we're not reckoning with. The, the government in charge will continue to behave like Ian Smith did. They will think they can last forever. But it's been shown globally, globally, not just in Zimbabwe, that when the people say enough is enough, when people say enough is enough, there is no government to, <coughs> to withstand that. That's just a reality. So look at history globally, and you come time and time again, you see that's what happens. So it is up to Zimbabweans, and that's why it's so important that you don't consider this as an Osana Moyo project. It is not. It is a Zimbabwean-owned project. You own it. And that leads me to the question about groundswell, who, how do you mobilize? I've talked to people sitting in this room. If you, in this room, believe that you are with me, it becomes your personal responsibility of mine. All your friends and family are people you should go and engage with. And I go back again. If I happen to be mistaken, and you are happy with where you are, then it's okay. You can go home and drink coffee, or tea, tanganda, whatever. But if you are unhappy with where you are, it is your responsibility to mobilize. It is your responsibility to explain to your friends, to your family, what choices confront us, what we can do to change our country. And that, as I've just told you, we can do it. We can absolutely do it. But am I going to be able to do it on my own? The answer is no. I've, I've got no such illusion. I understand that the power lies in the people. 
the power lies in the people recognizing mm -hmm. or saying to themselves they are fed up with what's going on, they are fed up with their lives not working properly, they are fed up with their children going to school and not getting jobs, and they say enough is enough. And the time has come to change. If that happens, change will come. Um, <coughs> Ground scale, that was the question of ground scale. Gender balance, gender balance. Valid question. This is not representative of what we're going to be doing, I can, I can guarantee you. It's absolutely not. And I would make a commitment right now that if you Zimbabweans honor me and elect me, the cabinet itself will be 50-50. It's not something to be negotiated or excuses to be found. Because the women are there who are capable and competent, we put no excuse for no gender balance. Mm -hmm. So that's not a subject for debate. It will be done. Thank you. <coughs> oh, Matebele, Matebele, yes. You know, again, life is uh, difficult. But we are very lucky. We are a lucky people in this sub-region because we've got an example of what we ourselves have done. I often quote the example of our people were killed in Chimoy. Our people were killed in Nyadzoya. Our people were killed in Lusaka. We got to 1980 and made a decision as a nation. We said, we are going to expend our energies in building a new Zimbabwe. We are not going to spend our energies trying to reconstruct the past. And arguably, actually, South Africa followed our example. Because Mandela, on release, did exactly the same in South Africa. It is my humble opinion, without in any shape or form de diminishing or devaluing the pain of the people of Matebele land, my appeal would be that mm -hmm. I want you to ask me to build a better Zimbabwe. I do not want you to ask me to reconstruct a past Zimbabwe. Because every day I spend trying to rebuild the past is a day that you deprive yourself and me of demonstrating that a different Zimbabwe is possible. I know that some people disagree with this approach. But I think if you start dragging yourself into trying to remake the past, you will have no time left to actually build and demonstrate that something different and beautiful is possible. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for answering the questions. Do we still have questions on the floor? Yes. Right. Um, my name is Luca Nure from Wange, much north. I'm a social commentator. My question um, is on power transfer. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, doctor, how would you um, Ascend to presidency with the previous claims that elections results were stolen. Then what strategies are there in place in that respect? Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, gentlemen, we have the comments. Thank you. King Lea is my name. Um, first, I must put a disclaimer. Um, I came in after the presentation was done. Um, perhaps Dr. Moyo dealt with it. But to me, I've got a strong sense of deja vu. Um, a few years ago, Dr. Simama Kony started a project similar to this one. Um, we all know how that ended. Um, can Dr. Moyo perhaps enlighten us as to the difference between this particular project and the previous um, unsuccessful project of his former colleague, Dr. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, one with the jacket. Fine. Uh, I'm Desmond Banda Sewa, a citizen, an activist, and a member of another political commission. Uh, I want to understand, <coughs> Dr. has ruled out the, because we have this court, Nera, Sinera, all these political alliances. I noted in his presentation, he said uh, mm -hmm. he has been 
approaching or being approached by a certain mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is he going to gain those already existing alliances? Then the, my second question is <coughs> on elections. Uh, ground floor was asked. But elections are not an event, it's a process. And ever since 2013, despite the challenges we have, <coughs> Uh, Zano PF is working, doing like using poverty, supplying people with drugs, that Chinese rice and stuff. Does Dr. Moe have the counter plan for that? <coughs> because at the end of the day, the rural folk, where like we grew up, they buy into this idea of like, who's bringing me what? Our, our electorate has been turned into mercenaries. So, what counter plan does he have? Thank you very much. Uh, last person. <coughs> okay, so, okay, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, this lady. I just wanted to find out um, specifically who is part of the alliance right now. And my second question is that you know that presidential campaigns require a lot of finances. Um, would you be prepared to share with us who some of your bankers are? Mm -hmm. And to confirm with in fact Strike Masiwa is a Muslim. Can you remember for that question?
let's not keep shifting responsibility. Let's take on the responsibility ourselves and say, on the basis of this information, and on the basis of what that needs to be done to solve the problems of my country, with the people who offer themselves for candidacy, who do I think, there are no guarantees, by the way, even I, you don't know, you've got some information, you don't know whether I'll take wrong when you elect me, but you've got some information on the best of which you make a decision. Given what you know, and given what is going on in our country, given what is going on around you in the world, who of the people who present themselves are you going to say, I think this individual, on the best of what I know, appears to me to have what it takes to manage this country and lead it into a different space. You have to make the decision on that, on that basis. So I do not think that my candidacy is the same as Simba's candidacy. The context is different. Where he was coming from was different. Where I've come from, the gen I've traveled, very, very different. So I think you've got enough on the best of which to make to draw a conclusion as to whether it's similar or not. <coughs> member of another political party uh, formation. I, uh, I can't remember what the question was. Is it uh, about alliances or what? There's somebody. Yeah. For near accord and so on. Maybe I was not clear about my example. When I gave you the example of uh, water and petrol, I was trying to answer that question. You see, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, because we are smart people, we need to make a, dif a distinction between people who are coming together in order to, to literally divide jobs among themselves and the people who are offering themselves with the clarity of the job that needs to be done. You know what puzzles me about our decision-making processes is that if today you walk out of this room and your child falls sick, and you take your child to the hospital, you are going to be very clear that if there is a, a choice of doctors, and you are told that a particular doctor is qualified, he's got a, a lot of experience, and they know what they're doing, you will make no hesitation whatsoever in taking either your wife or your child to that doctor. But when it comes to running our country, we don't seem to think the same. We don't seem to look at what is the job that needs to be done? What are the skills that are required? And therefore, what choices do I really have in making sure that the right person to solve these issues for my country is chosen? We, we, we use a different metrics for these decisions. But I want to persuade you that you should apply exactly the same discipline. When I get on a plane or on a train or in a car, I want to know that the person sitting at the wheel is qualified to drive me. I want to know that I'm safe because there is evidence that they've been trained to do what is required to be done. Running a country should be the same. Should be the same. Um, the issue of uh, people getting rights. Hmm. Very interesting question. Again, the basis of which I use for this is that a lot of us, not a lot of us, all of us, they've got pride. And our pride, I think, requires that our government facilitate for us to do things for ourselves. I think all parents would like to say, I sent my children to school. I can work and produce food for my children, for my family. I don't think there is any pride in once every five years, somebody coming and saying, I'll give you rice. I want to be able to farm and feed my own family myself. I don't think I'm an exception. I think most people are in that space. Am I implying that people are wrong to accept the rights? Not at all. I would like to make you understand that you can, see, you can accept the rights because it is the responsibility of a government to look after its people when their circumstances beyond what they can cope with on their own. When there is a drought in a particular part of this country, it is the responsibility of government to come and feed the people. But that should not take away from you your ability to choose the right leader when the time comes. 
Because whoever comes in, if they're doing their job properly, they will feed you anywhere if they're there. So the issue of the government feeding its people should be taken out of the equation of decision making. Because any government that comes in should do the same. So you should take that out and say, given where my country is and what needs to be done, who is the right person to lead it? They will also give you rights because it is their responsibility. In fact, where are they getting money from to give you rights? Where is the money coming from? It's coming, coming from the citizens. So other citizens are ensuring you. You are ensuring each other. One year there is a drought in one part of the country. All the citizens have been taxed. So the money this year goes to where there is a drought. Next year the drought might be in a different place. It's the citizens ensuring each other. And the government is just an instrument of implementation. So don't get taken in. It's not government rights. It is your rights. So don't let it take away your ability to make a decision of the government of the day uh, The last question was, I, I just wrote finances. Um, or uh, it was from the BBC then. I've got a different, you are right. Globally, we've turned our elections into a money exercise. Maybe I'm being naive, but I don't mind being naive. <laughs> I want to be naive because I want to create a different Zimbabwe. I want to persuade Zimbabweans that elections don't have to be about money. I want to make Zimbabweans understand that when you turn elections into money, you are being bought. And when you, have, when you allow yourself to be bought, you then have to put up with whatever is thrown at you afterwards. Elections should not be about money. You are sitting in this room. What money do you need to talk to your relatives, to talk to your friends, to debate with them who to elect. What money do you need? <coughs> but yes, people have turned it into a money exercise. I buy your vote, essentially. I believe that everywhere in the world where elections have been turned into a money exercise, you can see the evidence democracy has been undermined. So you have no financial No. And I don't think I need it. I don't think I need it. I think Zimbabwe should look at me in terms of what I can do for them, for us collectively. Not because I invite Zimbabweans for us as a nation to create our money. Because we can. I say it in my statement. We've got amazing resources in this country. They are ours as a people. They don't belong to government, they are ours. Our money is in our resources. Our money is in our people. So let's just learn to recognize that and not believe anybody who say they give us money. We don't need to be given money. We put the money in our resources and in our people. We make the money. Yes. The alliance is new. I'm launching it. So we are on a, you can join the alliance. Are you Zimbabwean? <laughs> join the alliance. You're welcome. Thank you, Doctor. I think you have yeah, it's a people's alliance, so everyone is free to join. The People's Alliance, not for particular individuals. Um, present on the floor. Last uh, four people only. Yes, I have given you. Thank you, sir. Okay, he wants to take that question now. 
You know, I, I think this is such a fundamental, such a fundamental question. I actually think that the platform on which I'm coming to you is fundamentally different. If you listen to me carefully, I'm saying I want to be the president who unites the public. And that's why we are forming a people's movement, not a political party. Political parties, again, I invite you to have a look across the continent. Political parties run the country for the party. Political parties don't run the country for the citizens. This is a major issue. It's such a major issue if you don't recognize that a nation that is not united will never succeed. Then I think you're really not getting the essence of what I offer. Second issue, I think anybody, anybody can make statements, just like we say, anybody can write a CV. But the essence of a CV, what it begins to guide you in, is to look back and see whether the claims that are being made by that individual have got any resemblance to what they've done in their life. I have worked as a manager to a very senior level in all sorts of companies. So as a manager, I would like to think I am different. And I think I understand what the execution means. I understand the difference between formulating plans, which most people can do, and what it means to translate plans into real pro product. <clears throat> the difference between somebody drawing the plan of this building and actually constructing it. Not the same thing. So I invite you to please look more closely. Firstly, at the issue of the unity of our country. Our country is not united. There is no evidence, to me anyway, that any of the parties at the moment are structuring themselves, approaching citizens in a manner that speaks to, I want to unite citizens. It's like, I want to create something where there are insiders and other people who are outsiders. Once you start on that platform, you will not succeed. Something that I didn't mention, which again I'm very clear about. You know, um, in this room, it doesn't, it's not rocket science for me to automatically understand that there will be lots of people from the intelligence services in this room, CIO. I've got no problem with it, let me explain why. Because being an intelligence officer is a career. And when that career is used properly, there is nothing wrong with it. Every country requires intelligence. You need to protect your citizens and the country through using intelligence services. We all need police to keep us as citizens safe. We all need the army to keep us safe. What has gone wrong in our country is that these services that we need as a society have been captured and saved a fraction of the society, not all the society. When you get stopped at a roadblock, you are not treated as a citizen. You are treated as a subclass in terms of if somebody comes and drives a car with number plates which indicate who they are, they are treated as another class of citizen. I think these things, you may think they are small things, are big, big issues in terms of what will it take to reconstruct our society? What will it take to rebuild our country? Management of the economy. I have worked in Washington. I've worked in finance most of my life. I've worked at the ADB. <coughs> I am a banker by training. I understand what makes an economy tick. Not in theory. Not in theory. I've actually done it. So if you ask me, what is the difference between me and all of these other formations, I say, look at the track record. Look at what the people who come to you saying, I'll do this and this and this for you, what they've actually done. Look at what they've done. And they compare and make the decision. Thank you very much for that response. <laughs> Last three. Yes, sir. Uh, you come with I'm in love more <coughs> uh, What would be your presidential limit if elected to have one? The second one is if the strategy say most of the MPs are from a different uh, formation, 
Are you going to jump ship again? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. I'm Gibson Budawan. Uh, doctor, my question is, every election year, yes, they keep on beating his name and entry. Each of his name and entry. These are four point candidates who take an election as an event, who did not invest their time before the election uh, to the betterment or the democratization of this country. What makes us so sure that this is not another Egypt name And do you really believe you will win this election? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now taking my last question. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Presidential limits. I am 65 years old. I've got kids who are beginning to have their own children. So I've got, I'm getting into the sort of grand father <coughs> stage. I think that if I were elected, I would not need mm -hmm more than one term, but I'm also clear what I'll be able to do in that one term. Building a country is not an event, and building a country does not get finished in one presidential term. I would have the clarity that my responsibility is to reset the foundations of this country in all the respects I've mentioned, national unity, national cohesion, mm -hmm. institutions of state that genuinely serve the people, and a functioning economy. I would also make it my responsibility, something I'm very used to in the private sector. Part of my responsibility would be begin to cultivate a team that would own the program. It would not be a Kosana Moyo program. It would be a team program. <coughs> so out of that team, I'd expect that there would be people who understood what we're doing would be able to take it on at a progressive rate. It's building a country not building my country, but a country that my children, my grandchildren, can live in and they see how we've progressively built it. So I would need more than one presidential term. So that's the answer to that one. <coughs> and investment, investment in what what popcorn Egypt or some such expression. So you know, again, my view is that Zimbabweans are not stupid people. Zimbabweans are intelligent people. And also, I would observe, by the way, that to my knowledge, I think virtually all Zimbabwean families participated and contributed to the liberation struggle. Virtually every family. So the structure of an argument which says people did not invest, I do not know where that comes from. I just don't know. People invested true in different forms. Some people, including my own brother, Cross the border and join the actual fighting. But you know that our whole society was in the infrastructure of executing this struggle. So everybody, everybody, every family, in my opinion, every Zimbabwean, therefore contributed to the genuine troubles. Do I believe I would win? It's not for me to say. It's, I, I am not, I am not going to claim the responsibility that belongs elsewhere. The responsibility for choosing who leads us is ours as a people. It's not for me to claim I win. It's for Zimbabweans to decide whether they think I would make an appropriate president for where we are. So if Zimbabweans choose, yes, I can win. But that choice is yours, not mine. All I can do is come in front of you explain to you what I think, explain how I think we'll go about building our country, be very clear in my opinion what the role of government is and how that should include all citizens and that the role of government is not about doing for you but for creating an environment where it allows you to be proud in doing for yourself and achieving 
And then Zimbabwe will listen to all of this and make a choice. What I would hope, though, is that I would get enough people who have not been participating in elections before to get excited about a new possibility. And they go and register and vote and participate. Let's take ownership of the creation of the future of our country. We can do it. It's absolutely possible. What do I think of President Mugabe? Let me give you a, an analogy of a relay race. In a relay race, there are teams that compete against each other. And each team is what about four, four, in a normal relay, four runners in one team. And what happens is that the first runner runs the first leg, and the discipline is understood that the runner gets to hand over the baton to the next runner. And so it goes on until the four complete the race. All four participate in the race. Yeah? What is clear also, and it does not take rocket science to understand, is that if one team, if the first runner of one team chooses not to hand over the baton, whilst everyone else is doing that, you know that that team is going to lose, don't you? It's, it's obvious. Because that runner will get tired, and the other teams will be renewing their, play, their runners for each leg. Personally, I believe that President Mugabe has run his leg of a relay. And, and I think we need to respect him for that. We need to respect him for the contribution he's made. But we also need to persuade him to understand that there comes a time when a disciplined participant in a relay race has to hand over the baton to the next runner in order for the total team to succeed. <laughs> So that's my view of President Mugabe. That he's done his bit, he's contributed, and brought the, he's made his mistakes, no, no doubt. Everybody will make mistakes. All of us. He's not perfect, I'm not perfect, but he has absolutely contributed and run his leg of the race. All we need to do now is persuade him that for the sake of all of us collectively, he should hand over that baton. Or else, all the other teams are going to leave us. And we we'll lose. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor, for sharing your vision with us. I would like to thank everyone who have uh, attended this press conference. I wish you well. Yeah. Thank you very much. This marks the end of the press conference.